Welcome back everyone to another Downward Day. And today on the channel you may notice that the presentation style is a little different. In fact, many of you could say that we're turning back the clock on this one, where I'm just talking into my microphone over a cartoon version of myself. That's right everyone, I've once again become a PNG tuber. We have gone back to the early days of Emplem and Commentary. Why try something new when you can just try something old? I have once again taken to hiding behind the camera despite making dozens of live action videos at this point. Now normally on YouTube that's not how this works. We kind of messed up the order of operations here. In fact, it feels like the development of this channel is actually regressing. And speaking of regressing, today we're talking about one of my favorite movie studios. Or at least one that I would have called my favorite at one time. But unfortunately, time has not been kind to this specific studio. Today we are discussing the downward spiral of Pixar. Well, maybe downward spiral is a little bit too harsh of a term. It's a phrase I should really reserve for extreme cases of dysfunction, and I'm not really sure that's the most appropriate way to describe what Pixar has become. I think rather than a sudden catastrophic collapse as what the term downward spiral would imply, Pixar's downfall has been more akin to a slow and steady march in a mediocrity. It's psychotic. They keep creating new ways to celebrate mediocrity. And this is something where if you happen to be a fan of animated movies, or even movies in general, you've most likely noticed, but perhaps have been a little too afraid to admit. I mean, there's one point in time where Pixar was the absolute gold standard, possibly in the entire industry of cinema. Where in the late 90s and early 2000s, this studio had a winning streak, kind of unparalleled compared to any other company that produced films at the time. And back then you really wound up with what was the perfect storm of events. Oftentimes in the modern film industry, critical acclaim and commercial success don't really go hand in hand. But Pixar cracked the code on this seemingly magic formula to release these extremely popular films that also retain their critical integrity. There was certainly a time where I remember as a kid when every Pixar release felt like this tremendous monumental event. It was a brand that had managed to build such prestige, such high anticipation and high expectations for their product that it got to the point where each new release would basically be a guaranteed success. In the mid-2000s, back when they released Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Cars, Ratatouille, the studio simply had this lightning in a bottle where they were able to achieve this incredibly rare feat of marrying critical acclaim and box office success. It was like every year you could count on one of the most popular iconic films coming from Pixar. You could count on Pixar dominating the Academy Awards, dominating review scores, where if you look at a site like Rotten Tomatoes today, aggregating the critic reviews of the time, it was rare for a Pixar film to fall below a 95% positive score. As in, for every one critic who gave these Pixar movies a thumbs down, you could count on 19 others giving it a thumbs up. And this remarkable string of success all of a sudden afforded Pixar a remarkable privilege in getting people into the theaters. Eventually, their reputation got so high that their brand name alone was enough to instantly pack the theaters, with people eager to see what their next masterpiece would be. And I think once Pixar achieved this vaunted status as the studio that could do no wrong, it didn't take long for them to become complacent, content with resting on their laurels. And gradually, ever so slowly, they began more and more to coast off of their prior success leaning on what they had already accomplished rather than feeling themselves with the ambition that had actually produced the golden age of their repertoire. Now, some of you may find this to be a rather controversial opinion, but if you ask me, the last truly great Pixar film was WALL-E. That, in my humble opinion, was the last film Pixar ever made that could truly be considered a cut above the rest. And I know some of you are probably thinking right now, but Emp, what about Up? The movie that has perhaps the most memorable and emotional scene that Pixar ever produced. And while yeah, I will say that the opening of Up is a very well done scene, there's no denying it, I've since grown to almost resent this scene for what's gonna sound like a pretty unusual reason. 
And that's because I believe that the immense success of this scene ultimately altered Pixar's underlying identity and changed the trajectory of the company to sort of the mediocre slump they're in today. And I truly believe that all of Pixar's problems today can be traced back to this one scene. A single scene that basically stole the show and soaked up the entire spotlight and overshadowed the fact that Up wasn't really that good of a film. Because a film is a total package. In order for the film to be great, in order for the film to truly achieve monumental success, it has to be firing on all cylinders. And Up, while a competently made film, was really lacking from the grandiosity, I feel, compared to Pixar's prior works from the decade. And all of a sudden, rather than getting a bunch of praise for making a great, well-rounded film, Pixar was instead getting all its praise from tugging at the heartstrings of the audience, producing a singular emotional beat rather than a total product. And we didn't know it at the time, but this one small seed planted in the opening of Up would end up dictating the creative direction of the company for the foreseeable future. So in general, I consider Up to represent the turning point of Pixar as a company, not just for the film itself, but for two coinciding events that occurred at around the same time. The first of which is Disney beginning to exercise creative control on the Pixar product. So Pixar, as it turns out, was not always owned by Disney, which seems to be becoming a lot more of a misconception these days. I think aside from some funding and equity provided by Steve Jobs and Apple, Pixar was pretty much an independent company. They didn't have to answer to any conglomerate above them, and this allowed them to exercise autonomy over the products they were creating. Specifically, it allowed them to take risks. They actually had the liberty to pursue projects which, on paper, may not have sounded like the most profitable thing in the world to a boardroom full of suits. They could actually tell these bold, innovative, new stories, which really helped contribute to their rise in the 2000s. Part of the reason why past Pixar releases used to feel so exciting is because you were expecting to get a new product. You were expecting to get some kind of unique story, an original screenplay, that was not a rehash or reboot of any pre-existing source material. Each new release felt fresh. It felt like something new. What does the chef have that's new? What is that? What is new? You? And this was a design aspect you immediately saw thrown out the window as soon as Disney took over. And of course, due to the length of production on all the Pixar projects, you didn't really get to see their creative influence take effect until a couple years after the acquisition. And going back to what I was saying earlier, WALL-E was pretty much the final Pixar project that was conceived and produced without the meddling influence of Disney executives. But even with the corporate takeover, it might have still been possible for Pixar to retain a little bit of that creative spark that had powered them through those first several brilliant years. If it wasn't for another cataclysmic event that occurred right around the same time as the Disney acquisition. And I'm of course talking about the 2008 financial crisis and subsequent Great Recession in the United States. A complete disaster for pretty much everyone in America who wasn't filthy rich. All of a sudden, money and disposable income dried up in this country real quick, and not as many people could afford to go to the movies. This, of course, meant that big Hollywood studios were no longer able to fund risky, ambitious projects. In the foreseeable future, for as long as the economic downturn lasted, it was now in the interest of the film executives to fund safe projects that they could be confident would make their money back. And this, of course, is where you start to see Pixar get pushed into its sequel era. It started with Toy Story 3, a pretty well-liked film, which some people I know actually say is their favorite Pixar film, but the memory of it is a bit tainted for me on account of how it was a sign of frustrating things to come. After that, you got Cars 2, which many people point to as the first truly bad Pixar film. And kind of more subtly, the point where Disney's influence is really starting to take hold. A movie that really didn't retain any of the rustic charm or melancholic themes of the original. A movie that, quite honestly, really only seemed like it was made to sell toys. The rights to which Disney now owned and was heavily profiting off of. And then after that, you'd eventually get Monsters University, Finding Dory, Cars 3, Incredibles 2, 
a seemingly never-ending list of sequels and prequels which many people would say were okay at the time, but in hindsight have really failed to leave any sort of lasting memory on the public consciousness. Looking back, most of the Pixar sequels are just not really vibrant creatively, and they were almost forever doomed to remain in the shadows of the original, which today continue to overshadow them as actual important contributions to culture. And despite the company's continued financial success during this era, this is the point in time where you start to see the company slip a bit in terms of their prestige. It just felt like with each passing year when Pixar would announce the new Pixar movie, and most of the time it was just another sequel or prequel to something they'd made a decade ago, you just started to feel the wind getting taken out of your sails, as the excitement and anticipation for the new Pixar release was eventually and gradually replaced with disappointment and eventually frustration. And to make matters even worse for Pixar, there was a new rising contender in the field of 3D animation which ironically came from their parent company. Because as Pixar was pumping out these lackluster sequels, Disney was seeing box office and critical success with their own 3D animated projects. You had movies like Tangled, Wreck-It Ralph, and Frozen becoming huge financial successes. And I think it's also important to note that at this point, Pixar has lost its visual edge over the competition. Another aspect that contributed to the company's early success is that they made the best looking 3D animated films out of any studio. They were the most innovative in terms of engineering. They were very clearly farther ahead of other studios in terms of solving challenges in computer animation. The first run of Pixar films could be considered technical marvels in and of themselves. They'd always be the first studio to figure out how to render realistic hair or water or collision physics. And for a while, this immense attention to detail really pushing the needle on what was possible in computer rendering. It really gave the Pixar movies a visual edge over the competition. There was about a 10 or 12 year span where no other movie really looked like a Pixar movie, and that again was another aspect that made them unique. But once again, when you start to enter the 2010s, computer processing power has become very efficient. And by this point, it's getting harder and harder to differentiate between the visual quality of a Pixar film and just a regular Disney animated film. I remember as a kid around this time seeing stuff like How to Train Your Dragon and Wreck-It Ralph and thinking that these films looked about 95% as good as Pixar. And that was something that you just really couldn't say before. So all of a sudden in the early 2010s you have a situation where Disney movies are starting to feel like Pixar movies and Pixar movies are starting to feel like Disney movies. The consequence of which was Pixar's brand getting further diluted. I mean, I think in a two-year span, you had both Disney Animation and Disney Pixar release a princess movie. And then sandwiched in between the two car sequels, you had the plain spin-off that was set in the universe from a Pixar movie, but was under the Disney Animation banner. Basically, you took Pixar, which once had such a strong, unique brand identity, and you ended up crossing the beams with this rival, similar competitor from within the same company. And in several cases at this time, you actually saw Disney films eclipsing the success of Pixar films, as was the case with Frozen and Brave. Frozen was much more of a financial success. And what started to happen, or at least how it was perceived by moviegoers, was that Pixar had lost its identity. You had this animation studio that not long ago was renowned for putting out great stories with top-of-the-line animation that made a bunch of money at the box office. And within pretty much a five-year span after Disney bought them out, they lost all three of those things that were the most identifiable markers of the brand. Their films were no longer the most visually stunning. They no longer were the most financially successful. And the underlying quality of the films and stories they were telling had come into serious question. It got to the point where by the middle of the 2010s, it seemed like everyone had lost sight of what a Pixar film actually was. They just kept coming out with more and more mediocre sequels. And if you think mediocre is a bit too harsh of a word, you'd at the very least be hard pressed to say that any of the Pixar sequels or prequels managed to surpass or even equal the quality of any of the originals. And as time has gone on, the continued cultural irrelevance of all the Pixar sequels have only proven this point. 
But even more alarming than Pixar's string of milquetoast sequels were ironically their new attempts at original stories. As we just discussed, Brave was a pretty lackluster release and got straight up dominated by Frozen both financially and culturally. The Good Dinosaur would come out of the gates as the biggest flop that the brand has ever produced. It would seem that with the immense amount of time and resources that the company was now investing into pumping out sequels, they had seemingly forgotten how to write original screenplays. And the disturbing lack of financial and critical success of Pixar's new IPs in the 2010s really just contributed more to this self-fulfilling prophecy where they almost had to fall back on sequels to continue turning out a profit. Because for whatever reason, whether they had lost their way or audiences no longer cared, Pixar's new original stories were flopping. Of course, out of all the new stories that Pixar tried to tell through the 2010s, one was far more successful than all the rest. I'm talking about Inside Out, a film celebrated by many as a gallant return to form for the studio. And again, some of you are probably going to see this as a controversial opinion, but I never understood the hype behind Inside Out. I remember when it came out, people so desperately wanted to treat it as another Pixar masterpiece, worthy of being in the same category as Toy Story and The Incredibles. And I just never really saw it. For me, a film like Inside Out checks the boxes of what appears to resemble a classic Pixar movie superficially. But all the people and critics at the time who try to put it on the same level of something like The Incredibles, I don't know, to me it demonstrated a lack of understanding of what really made those first Pixar films truly special. The qualities of those films that allow us to still remember them fondly today, compared to every other animated film that was released during that time. And, uh... How do I put this lightly? The qualities that made the original Pixar films great certainly didn't have to do with making sappy lessons for children. And look, it's going to be hard not to offend a lot of people out there by saying this, but the original run of Golden Age Pixar movies used to carry themselves with a level of sophistication that pretty much none of the new Disney-era Pixar films have. And this is not just some sort of bias I had from watching those older movies when I was younger and understood less. I have periodically and continually returned and rewatched these movies as I've gotten older, and it's simply no question. The 2000s era Pixar movies are just simply more maturely written than the modern ones. The themes presented within are simply loftier. They say something more profound about the nature of society, and often delve into frightening and uncomfortable subject matter. The plaintiff, Oliver Sansweet, who was foiled in his attempted suicide by Mr. Incredible. And that's where I have a point of contention with anyone who tries to put Inside Out in the same league as something like The Incredibles. It is simply a different style of movie. One that has the makings and a few stylistic and aesthetic underpinnings of classic Pixar, but one that ultimately comes off as neutered in execution, unwilling to venture into bolder territory, and to say something with a film that might run the risk of pissing a few people off. And ultimately, my problem with a movie like Inside Out, and a lot of people are not going to want to hear this, but it needs to be said, Inside Out feels like a movie made for moms and children. And this, unfortunately, is an overarching problem that is affecting pretty much every new movie that Pixar is coming out with today. It seems like no matter what magical, whimsical, animated world Pixar creates now, it always ends up leading to the same hollow sentimentality. It's like Pixar now constructs entire films around a feel-good, emotional little moment that tugs at your heartstrings, but ultimately says nothing about anything. It started as just that little seed that was planted all the way back at the opening sequence of Up, and it is now ballooned into the entire overarching creative direction of the company. And look, I'm not personally opposed to the idea of sentimentality in movies. If Pixar wants to make one or two movies about some sad sack character's emotional journey, then fine, go ahead. But where it starts to get annoying and frustrating is when some character's emotional journey is the basic plot outline for pretty much every new story you're coming out with. It's fine for a movie to be sentimental, but you can only rely on sentimentality so much before it starts to become sappy, and your little emotional, tear-jerking moments start to feel contrived and over-relied on. And that's honestly how it's felt watching Pixar movies for the last eight years. 
And it sucks because I finally got my wish, we all got our wish, Pixar stopped making so many sequels, and they're finally coming out with original stories. But they end up betraying the idea of originality entirely because it feels like every single one of these new stories has the same core set of emotional beats, where some emotionally insecure protagonist has to get in touch with their emotions, and they end up learning some completely non-subtle lesson about how it's okay to feel a certain way, or how it's okay to sacrifice certain things. And like I said, I'd be fine if they did it one or two times. And who knows, I'm probably oversimplifying or overgeneralizing here. But does anyone get the feeling that the last five original Pixar movies have basically told the same story, but with different characters? Like, is that too outrageous of a statement to make? I don't know, maybe after the last five Pixar movies all telling me to get more in touch with my emotions, I'm finally ready to come out and be honest with how I feel. So several weeks ago, I went to the theater to watch two separate animated films. One of the films was Pixar's latest release, Elemental, and the other was Across the Spider-Verse. And wow, the stark difference in these two projects is what inspired me to create this video in the first place. Because folks, there's no sugarcoating it here. And I, I don't think that this is a very subjective thing to say. But my god, did Spider-Verse blow Pixar out of the water. Spider-Verse was just far and away the superior product. And it didn't feel close. It was not close at all. You can see that reflected by how much people are still talking about Spider-Verse and how Elemental has already become an afterthought. And based on my own personal assessment, I found Spider-Verse to be the stronger film in just about every single aspect of filmmaking. Better story, better characters, better score. Even the animation, which is supposed to be Pixar's whole shtick, was superior in Spider-Verse. And I've always been someone who's been a great appreciator of Pixar's early work. I'm speaking as someone who's been continuously rooting for them to turn things around and a break out of this more than decades long slump they seem to find themselves in. So you have to take my word for it that I'm not some kind of hater, and I don't have some kind of vendetta against Pixar. I wouldn't care so much or have gone through the trouble of making this whole long-winded video, this whole long-winded speech, if I didn't care about Pixar deep down. But with all that said, it's time to face the facts. And as things currently stand, they have not just fallen back to the rest of the competition, they have fallen behind. They are now playing catch up to the rest of the animated film market. And it's not even like they've fallen behind some long term rival like DreamWorks who finally surged ahead like Coke versus Pepsi. They've fallen behind Sony Animations, who less than a decade ago was pumping out stuff like the Emoji Movie. I just wanted to highlight that real quick to make that distinction, just to show how far Pixar has fallen. That they're now basically getting dominated by the studio that made the Emoji Movie. And man, if there was ever a testament to show that Pixar has fallen on hard times, this would have to be it. Up until a week and a half before Elemental came out, I didn't even know that it existed. I never saw any marketing, I never heard anything about it from word of mouth. Nobody cared. It was just this sad indictment of how Pixar, once the can't-miss studio, has now become basically irrelevant in pop culture. I mean, did anyone care that Elemental came out? And sure, for the past month and a half, I've seen the Pixar diehard fans running damage control for the movie, trying to say, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, people should give it a chance. Oh, it's not that much of a financial shortfall. Like, I'm sorry, maybe you liked it. Maybe you found it cute and charming like all the other Pixar movies they've released in the past eight years. Doesn't change the fact that it had no cultural impact. Nobody cares about it. Nobody. I haven't seen or heard anyone who isn't a Pixar super fan extolling how good the movie is. Because most people didn't go see it. And most of the people who did go see it were really underwhelmed. I mean, what do you get when you mix fire and water? I guess you just get a lukewarm, tepid experience. And that's what it was like watching Elemental. A lukewarm experience. Yet another Pixar movie that looks good, looks real pretty. You watch it, you feel kind of good, walking out of the movie, and then you just forget about it after a day. Because there's nothing in the movie that's actually impactful on a deeper philosophical level. And I'm sorry if you're sitting there as a Pixar super fan and you're bitter and resentful that not enough people cared about Elemental, not enough people supported Elemental. 
I don't have anything else to tell you other than that's the fault of the filmmakers for not making people care. It's not up to the consumer to work themselves up and pretend to care about something just to make themselves feel like less of a dope for liking it. It's up to the filmmakers, the studio, to deliver a product that people actually want to care about. A product that's worth caring about. And I'm sorry out there if you really loved Elemental, but in my assessment it was just another mediocre nothing movie from Pixar, which is what they've been coming out with, by and large, for the last 10 years. And you can't just pump out mediocrity for 10 years straight and expect people to keep showing up or having the same level of excitement and enthusiasm towards the product. It's just not going to happen. People are going to move on to the next thing that's actually exciting and innovative, which in this case is Spider-Verse. And perhaps the main reason Spider-Verse was so much of a better product than Elemental was that it seemed like the filmmakers in Spider-Verse actually had the license and liberty to take creative risks. A privilege that used to be afforded to the creative minds at Pixar and one that you'd be hard-pressed to say they still have today. And to me, Elemental just came off as a product that wanted to pretend that it's interesting, ambitious, and sophisticated, but one whose creators did not have enough faith in the project to actually execute it that way. And when it's clear that the creators don't have faith in their own project, why should the audience? You want to touch on real-world issues of discrimination and racism against immigrant groups, but then when you actually go tell the story, nothing in it is actually motivating why that's the case. The entire conceit of the story you're trying to tell is unmotivated. Like, why is it that all the other element groups in Element City are so mean to the fire people? What did the fire people do? I mean, clearly you're led to think that the fire people pose some kind of physical threat to the grass people, but there's multiple times in the movie where grass people get burnt up to a crisp and they're physically fine. So what's the problem? Do the element people not feel physical pain? Then if so, what's the danger of having the fire people there? And to section them off in their entire little quarantine part of town. Like what reason is there that the fire people are treated as second class citizens? These are major questions required for the believability of the world. To prevent the whole thing from feeling like this contrived eclectic amassment of ideas. And the whole time you just never get an answer for any of it. It's just that way because it is. And maybe some dark thing happened in the past that would have actually made the relationships between the characters and the different groups of elements compelling. But that's never shown. That's never discussed. Most likely out of some fear of making a political statement in this movie whose theme is inherently political. I mean, it's just lazy design on the part of the filmmakers to only want to dip their toe into the idea of the immigrant struggle in America without actually going any further to add tension to the plot and showing the true ugliness that comes with that topic. Like the worst things that any of the element people ever do to each other is call each other names. You're expecting me to believe that there's bad blood in this deeply segregated, troubled society? It just doesn't make sense and it's lazy design. These are major structural problems that prevent the film from being as compelling as it could be and it's just ignored. The whole conflict of the story is based around this premise that the element groups are supposed to hate each other when everyone in the film is just a total sweetheart. And this is another thing that has contributed to so many weak stories from modern Pixar movies. Everyone is just the sweetest, nicest person in the world. Like, does anyone remember when Pixar used to have just bastard characters? The movies used to be full of them. Just cruel, hostile, unforgiving characters. Kind of like how a lot of people are in the real world. It's kind of hard to get immersed in a story where every single person in it is the sweetest, nicest person ever and they always act in good faith. They always have a good conscience and do the right thing. Every single person in modern Pixar movies has to be this wholesome figure that soccer moms feel comfortable posting on their Facebook page. And this sort of becomes a bit of a distraction when you're trying to sell the story of the struggles of an immigrant family in a foreign land. Do you think that maybe presenting everyone as super nice all the time kind of takes away from the tension in the conflict? And I'm not going to sit here and give a full scene-by-scene -scene review of Elemental, because what I just described is already my primary gripe against the movie. And this kind of sickening wholesomeness of modern Pixar movies today fits into my larger point about how people these days have lost sight of what actually made the original 
Golden Age Pixar films great. I find it quite strange today where when you hear and see people talk about Pixar movies, the discourse usually always fixates around this expectation that they're going to cry at some sappy emotional scene. And I'm sorry, but if your idea of a Pixar movie is some rainbow cotton candy world that eventually makes you cry at the end, you're not describing the old Pixar, the Pixar consisting of the films which most people associate with the brand. And it's bizarre to me how people have forgotten this, but the original run of critically acclaimed Pixar movies that everyone liked. They didn't tell these wholesome, sentimental stories of characters learning to get in touch with their emotions. If you actually go back and watch Pixar's most critically acclaimed movies from the 2000s, each of them presents a very dark, cynical, and twisted world. The true Pixar formula, if there ever was one, doesn't have anything to do with sentimentality. It had to do with cynicism. Like Toy Story features toys getting dismembered and experimented on by some psycho kid. Monsters, Inc. takes place in a corrupt, greedy corporate factory. Finding Nemo features the protagonist of the film having all but one of his children literally eaten by a predator. The Incredibles features a literal superhero being shackled by society and forced to become a wage slave at an insurance company. Even Goofy Cars, which everyone thinks is a silly, stupid thing now, centers around the erasure of small-town America. Like every single one of the early Pixar films has a dark, cynical bite to it. The filmmakers weren't afraid to portray the world, our world, as a bit of a nasty and hostile place. I mean, hell, WALL-E literally shows the Earth getting ruined by people to the point where we had to evacuate. Not out of any tragic natural disaster, no, because of our hedonistic, materialistic society which polluted the earth beyond repair. Like, I'm sorry, are any of these movies wholesome? They may have wholesome or cute moments sprinkled in, but the underlying themes usually deal with a hostile and unforgiving world. And that actually allowed the films, the early Pixar films, to touch on more mature and sophisticated themes, because they portrayed their worlds and characters how an adult would see them not how a child would see them. And for people to have this impression that Pixar only got to where they got, that they could only build their empire by being wholesome and sentimental, it is just simply not the truth. And to prove to myself that was the case, shortly after watching Elemental, I sat down and rewatched Ratatouille, which is perhaps Pixar's most sophisticated film. And dude, just seeing the difference in presentation between a movie like Ratatouille and a movie like Elemental. It's hard to believe the same studio made it. It's hard to believe that overlapping people were even involved. I mean, Ratatouille features guns, people threatening each other with knives. All the characters are extremely twisted and messed up and corrupted people. There's an actual scene in Ratatouille that shows dead rats hanging in the window of an exterminator shop. And this is long after it's been established that the rats are sentient and have human intelligence. Pixar and the filmmakers at the time were just simply unafraid of showing dark aspects of the world. They were unafraid to show people as anything other than squeaky clean goody two-shoes types who spend all day crying over the smallest sentimental beats. And man, Ratatouille came out just over 15 years ago. It wasn't that long ago, but to just see how much they've changed. And how that change has contributed to just a mediocre product. It's disheartening. It's disheartening to see a brand become synonymous with high quality products. Just to watch those products slowly and gradually degrade into something that's just a mere imitation of what it once represented. And I guess maybe that's the reason why I care so much about it. Why I bother talking about it at length. It just really bothers me to see truly great things become mediocre. And it's not just Pixar. It's a lot of other stuff that I once thought was great has become mediocre. It's just that Pixar is perhaps the most iconic example of it. A studio that once prided itself on excellence by making these greatly enriching products that could be enjoyed by anyone on a deep level. And it's frustrating to see a studio which once stood for something slowly turn into yet another product for moms to go take their kids and nothing more. 
I mean, I guess at the end of the day, we still have the old movies to enjoy and the memories of a company that once could do no wrong. But now it seems extremely unlikely that Pixar will ever reach the level of acclaim that they once had. I mean, earlier this year, about half of their workforce got laid off. So it's hard to imagine that they're going to have an easier time making something great now. I wouldn't be surprised if, in just a few years, the Pixar animation branch merges with Disney entirely and just simply fades away into the overall banner of Disney animation. Officially, it would finally represent the total erasure of Pixar's identity. And let's be honest, it would be the merciful end to a process that began long ago.